Hello, Lena. Welcome to Mr. Quaker's Teachers. In this lesson, I'll be providing the character profile and traits for Amaka Ifiodora from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's novel Purple Ibiscus. This analysis will be particularly helpful for those sitting either the GCSE or IGCSE or any other exam where you need to speak about the character of um, Amaka from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's novel Purple Ibiscus. Let's dive in. Now, Amaka is called Ifiodora because that's the name of a father. So if you observe, um, I've not highlighted the name because that's the name. I'm not certain if it's the first name or the surname of a father. But I've written here about nine character traits that we see from her, from the novel. Um, the first is that Amaka shared a very close bond with her maternal grandfather, Papa Nuku. The second is that she managed her assigned home chores well. The third character trait I see is that she held controversial opinions on certain issues. And then the fourth is that she fascinated her cousin, Kamdili. The fifth is that she was very confrontational and assertive towards Kamdili. And then the, the, that's, the, that's the fifth, sorry. The sixth is that Amaka is mouthy and spoke freely but respectfully to other people. So she's quite vocal. The seventh is that she's knowledgeable and gossipy. The eighth is that she has an artistic flair. And then finally, Amaka loves to laugh. Those are the nine traits that I see from her. But there's also a very important aspect to Amaka. Amaka's relationship with a cousin of the same age, the narrator, Kambili. That's a very, very interesting um, sort of subplot in the narration and i'm going to refer to it as we continue as i continue the analysis now let me begin by describing amaka according to no the novel she's the oldest child and do daughter of auntie Ifoma, and the 15 year old cousin and age mate of kambili kambili is the narrator it is through kambili's eyes that we see the events in the play amaka is initial initially despises her cousin kambili so she initially she had a very confrontational and assertive relationship with Kambli, mainly because of her, Kambli's wealth. But later, she warms up to Kambli when she speaks for herself. Kambli finally speaks for herself in the famous um, Aura, O-R-A-H, O-R-A-H um, encounter, when Kambli speaks for herself. Amaka is shocked and says, yeah, so you have a voice. And from then onwards, we see that they have, they become friends. So, when Kambili speaks for herself, she realizes that, like her, Kambili also has challenges as well. I think initially, um, Amaka sort of disliked Kambili because of Kambili's father. You know, he's a wealthy man. She thinks that Kambili has everything. They have um, television. They have the, um, decoder and all, all the other things. And in her mind, Kambili is snobbish because Kambili does not, is not very vocal. But I think as she interacts with Kambili more and more, she realizes that Kambili has problems at home, like and like, like her, Kambili's life is not perfect either. In terms of her physical description, this is how Kambili describes Amaka. She says, Amaka was a thinner teenage copy of her mother. She walked and talked even faster and with more purpose than Auntie Foma did. So if you um, remember Kambili's description of Auntie Foma, she, say, she says, for example, that Auntie Foma speaks very fast. And then Auntie Foma spoke also she was fearless in uh, in the manner in which she spoke but here she tells us that amaka spoke faster and with more, more purpose than anti informa and she also tells us that only her uh, eyes are different so amaka's eyes are different they did not have the unconditional warmth of anti informers and we know that Kambili liked her paternal aunt anti informa because anti informa was very warm very jovial she 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 always she's always laughing and she al also was very accommodating of Kambili's behavior you know i suspect because she realizes that 
uh, Kamila had to deal with a lot. I mean, I mean, she grew up with Chief Eugene, so I suspect Auntie Foma understood who her brother was. And Kamila goes on to say that they were quizzical eyes, so eyes that ask questions, many questions, and do not accept many answers. And that's one of the things we're going to see about Maka. That Maka loves to ask questions, but then she's very assertive in her attitude when she asks questions. Now let's look at the first character trait that we see from Amaka. Kamili, according to the narration, tells us that Amaka shared a very close bond with her maternal grandfather, Papa Nuku. And Amaka was particularly fond of Papa Nuku. She took different actions to please him. And we see that in the quotes. The gate swung open and Amaka came out, walking close enough to Papa Nuku to support him if he needed it. So around this point, they had gone to Papa Nuku's house to fetch him so they can go and look at the Mo masquerade. We're told here that Amaka was working close enough to Papa Nuku, so if there's a need for her to support him, she will do so quickly. Papa Nuku, are you comfortable, Amaka asked, leaning across toward the front seat. Do you want to adjust your seat to make, you more, to make more room for you? So we see here that Amaka went out of her way to make... Papa Nuku's um, uh, comfortable in the seat as they drove or as they prepared to drive to, to, the, to where they can to watch the masquerades. She laughed when her grandfather said he will be joining his ancestors soon, Amaka I mean, saying he says things like this so that we can do things for him. And we see that in the quote, Amaka is the one speaking here. He likes to talk about dying soon, Amaka said in amused English. He thinks that will get us to do things for him. So she was, uh, Amaka was very fond of her, her, her grandfather, Papa Nuku. Although Amaka ridicules most supernatural occurrences, she turned away from the Umo masquerade as soon as her grandfather, Papa Nuku, spoke about the Umo and how women are not supposed to look at it. Her actions reveal a regard for him. So when they went to um, look at the Umo masquerade, Papa Nuku mentions that, um, says that this masquerade is not. The one that girls are supposed to look at. So we see that in the quote. Don't look, girls. Let's humor your grandfather, she said in English. Amaka had already looked away. So here, this anti former that is speaking. But it's Papa Nuku that says, this masquerade, this particular masquerade, or this particular mo, is not something that women are supposed to look at. And Kambili says that when anti former says, let's humor your grandfather, let's turn away, you know, humor him. Amaka had already looked away. So Amaka did not even wait for her mother to say something before she looked away. But we, ob we observe, for example, that later on, when even though she's very friendly with Father Amadi, when he says that she should choose an English name for her confirmation, she refuses. Her love of Papanuku is also shown when he came to Insuka when he was sick. So when Papanuku was, was sick and was brought to Insuka by Auntie Informa, Amaka's actions also, also shows that she really, really li likes him. You know, she, she has a very close bond with him. She loves him. Quote, Papa Nuku is sick, Amaka said shrilly. Mom, when did you know? You should have told us. Amaka shouted. Here, Kamili uh, tells us that uh, um, Papa Nuku was sick for a while. And even though Auntie Fama had been told, she was worried about how she was going to fetch him from Aba to Nsoka. I mean, it's quite a distance. And as she worried about that, I mean, they told her in the morning, as she worried about that, later on when Fadamadi comes and then she's not smiling and he asks her what was wrong and then she says this, Amaka immediately said, Papa Nuku is sick? Mom, when did you know? You should have told us. She shouted. So we see here that she was very interested in Papa Nuku's well-being. When Papa Nuku arrived in Suka because he was sick, Amaka scampered out of the house to greet him. They even shared a laugh. And this is how Kambili tells us. Says, Amaka ran out of the run out and pressed the side lightly to Papa Nuku's. But he smiled and said something that made Amaka laugh. So the quote reveals to us that there's this sort of love, intense love that Amaka has for uh, Papa Nuku. And we also see that even her meal plan revolved around Papa Nuku when he was there, when he, you know, what he likes when he came to Nsoka. And we see that in the quotes, Amaka is the one speaking here. I'll make often salah for dinner. Papa Nuku likes that, Amaka said. So she did not wait for anybody to make any request. 
She instead she decided to make what she knew that Papa Nuku was would like. Amaka also questioned her mother's urgency to take Papa Nuku to the hospital and was pleased that the doctor came to treat him at home. And we see that in the quotes. Will you take him to the medical center today or tomorrow morning, mom? Amaka asked. So when immediately Papa Nuku came, she wanted to find out from her mother when her mother would take Papa Nuku to the medical center. Amaka was also pleased that Dr. Nduma had come to the house, right? She was pleased. And she, 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 she says, for example, that the fumes alone in the stuffy clinic could choke Papa Nuku, she said. So she was pleased that um, Papa Nuku and um, Dr. Nduma had come home to cater or look after to treat Papa Nuku. Instead of going to the, to the clinic and she's saying that the clinic there is very stuffy and that would have choked him. When Dr. Nduma made a home call to see Papa Nuku, Amaka went with him to observe how he would handle Papa Nuku. And we see that in the quotes. Amaka followed him into her bedroom to look at Papa Nuku. And then later on we are told that eating diarrhea at night is not right, Amaka said. But she was not scowling as, as she usually did when she complained. Instead, she had that fresh smile that showed the gap in her teeth. The smile she seemed to always have when Papa Nuku was around. So we see that even Kambili observe, herself observed this. She observed it. So even though Amaka was talking about, I was saying that Gary is not something eats in the night. She, you know, she was, she was, she, she wasn't scowling. She wasn't angry about it. There's this, um, um, she's relaxed. And she's, she, she has like this smile that according to Kambili, she only has when Papa Nuku is, was around. And later on, she goes on to, she tells her mother that her mother should allow Papa Nuku to stay. She says, he must stay for a while, Amaka said. Maybe he should live here, mom. I don't think that girl, Chinyelu, takes proper care of him. So as Papa Nuku begins to recuperate and get better, Amaka tells her mother that Papa Nuku should stay there with them, like permanently. Because she doesn't think that the girl that takes care of him, Chinyelu, um, takes um, proper care of him. So this again reveals to the reader that she has a very close bond and a, a, a liking for her maternal grandfather. Amaka was in the living room with Papa Nuku, slowly oiling the few tufts of hair on his head with Vaseline. Afterwards, she smoothed that powder on his face and chest. So we see here that it's like some sort of like a luxury pampering. It's like it's at the spa and then she's just taking good care of him. Amaka and Papa Nuku spoke sometimes, their voices low, twinning together. They understood each other using the sparest words. So again, Kambili observes the way they interact with each other. And she observed that Amaka and Papa Nuku had a very close relationship. Hello, learners. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson so far. This is a sample analysis of the novel Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. The complete course contains video analysis of the characters, settings, themes, conflicts, etc. To assess the full analysis, purchase the entire course at mrquakestitches.com. Find the purchase links in the description below. See you in class.